Okay, sounds great. Okay, that's cool, man. But uh, Nathan, thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure to, to see you and speak to you. And uh, everybody is busy these days. I know that you're a busy man. You've got family. You've got your uh, your music going on. So it is appreciative that you take the time out of your day uh, to speak to myself. But before we get started with the conversation, how are you doing? I'm doing well, all things considered. You get a little older each day, gets a little a little different every time. You never know what you're going to wake up to. But other than that, I'm great. That's good. As long as, long as you've got your health, I suppose that's the main thing. <laughs> health, I got my health. Health and music. <laughs> health, music, and uh, right now I've got birds outside the window. That's helpful. Well, there you go. But uh, we're going to talk about all things music. Um, and what we'll do is we'll go right back to the very beginning for yourself. So first of all, Nathan, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Iowa City, Iowa, in the uh, middle of the country. And uh, my father is a, a professor at the university there, although um, <clears throat> being a professor at the university was different in the 60s and 70s than it is now. Yeah. So it was more of a workaday thing. And um, I was originally born in Chicago, but <clears throat> I started out my life in Iowa City. Cool. And were you into music from a very young age? Yeah, very much so. Um, a lot of this is told to me, of course. Um, but I was in very, very heavily involved in uh, li relating to what was coming my way from, I think, a very early age, six, seven, eight years old. Um, but no real concept of of it being more than just something you listen to at that point. Yeah. Uh, you know. So where did you, was your musical influences when you were very young, was that coming from your parents? I think so. My parents, my father had played trumpet as a young man, some jazz, some big band. Um, and so there was a lot of music in the house. There was jazz, there was blues, there was uh, an awful lot of um, what, the, at the, you know, what they called black music at the time, but there's such a blend now that it would be hard to use the term. But yeah. uh, there was a lot of that and there was um, a lot of, and my father's a poet, so there was a lot, there were a lot of words as well. And that made the two things together. And what about, see for yourself, do you remember, was there an age where you discovered your own type of music that you enjoyed? Something that was different from what your parents were listening to? Well, my parents unfortunately were cool enough that I'm not sure I ever fully <laughs> escaped their influence. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I sort of, I mean, Hendrix was my, my first true love, you know, and uh, and that was that went on for a little while until I stumbled on uh, Neil Young's album Harvest, and right. that sort of changed my direction a little bit. But the truth of the matter is, um, I have a fairly wide number of genres that I listen to and enjoy, um, and I think that <laughs> this is going to sound funny. I don't think I was a fully uh, formed musician, musical person until I was about. 50 years old, to be honest right. with you. Okay. Yeah. And um, I know that you obviously, you sing, you play the guitar. Was was the guitar your first instrument? Uh, trumpet was my first instrument, but I didn't yeah. like to practice. Um, I got by on uh, natural talent and luck. And then after a while, I realized that what I really wanted to do was be able to sing at the same time. Um, and you, trumpet and singing doesn't work quite the way guitar and singing works. So how, how did you get into the guitar? What age were you? Uh, I was, I'm going to say I was 12. I, I could have been a little earlier. And I got a harmony guitar that I think came from my grandfather. Um, uh, primarily by accident, but it showed up. And uh, it was strong. I didn't know anything about a guitar, so it was strong with at least medium gauge strings. And it was strong with old medium gauge strings. And I just tore my hands up on it for a full year before yeah. it dawned on me that and maybe I needed lessons. Uh, but it did result in me having a ridiculously strong left hand. <laughs> and did you um, did you go to lesson or did you just, were you self-taught? How, how did you learn play? Well, it's, in it's interesting. I was self-taught. And then when I realized I needed somebody to help me, my father, who was very perceptive, uh, my late father, who was very perceptive, uh, realized that my learning style was pretty much don't tell me anything. And uh, 
he had a student who had been in a fairly successful band on the West Coast, and his name was John Bowie. And I just sat and played with John for about a year and a half. And in that year and a half, um, I just learned by virtue of him saying, no, do this, don't do that. Um, And then from then on out, it's been pretty much self-taught. What about um, singing? Because singing, I've spoke to quite a few people about this. And regardless of, you know, whether it be the drums, whether it be the guitar, the bass guitar, you know, you can get shown things from other musicians, you know, try playing this, try doing this. Singing seems to be the one that's completely different and separate from the... <laughs> because there's a, a very large part of singing is confidence. And, or in some people's case, lack of confidence. That's why they don't do it. Um, but there's a lot of people that you do have to have a talent. You need to be able to hold a tune. You need to be able to listen, to hear yourself. But there is a huge part of it is confidence, which you, you can't teach someone. How did you get into singing? Well, as I said, I wanted to sing. I started to like the kinds of songs that you had to sing. Um, yep. And I have to be honest with you, singing is a fucking nightmare. <laughs> and I, I, have, I have terrific pitch. That's one thing I have. Um, mm-hmm. Everything else, I got a scratchy voice. It's in a weird register. It doesn't quite, I have a decent range, but it doesn't quite fit any music style. Maybe it fits blues, country a little bit, but so I was always confident singing, but I didn't have any right to be. Um, and, I, and I just sang and sang and sang and sang, and <clears throat> eventually I ruined my voice. Um, and in my 20s, uh, I, had, I spent about two lessons with a voice coach who fixed all the technical problems very quickly, just mm-hmm. able to show me how to breathe. And from then out, it hasn't really been a problem. Although as you age, you lose some flexibility. Uh, I'm about to go in the studio to record an album, and I'm more concerned about my voice than I would normally be because there's clearly been some changes in the last few years. I suppose there's that that cool thing as well, though, that with time, you can get a a tone to your voice that is missing when you're younger. Oh, I I don't think I sang as well or was able to sing as expressively or sound as uh, present as it started to happen in my 40s and 50s. Because my voice was never suited to a young man's vo- voice. It was, my music was never suited to a young man's music. And so I kind of knew, I actually knew in my 20s and 30s that I was just biding time, that things would start to come together for me in my 40s and 50s. And ironically, nobody, nobody agreed with me on that, but now they apparently do. So I, you know, I don't know. The CTI of singing, and playing the guitar, which one are you more confident doing? Uh, it's, it's equal. I've played guitar for a long time, and if you ask me, well, you know what? That's not true. If you ask me how to, if I could make a living playing with somebody else, I'm a terrible harmony singer, so I would say guitar. <laughs> okay. So obviously you're saying as well, um, there was Jimi Hendrix, Neil Young. Who were your other influences growing up? Uh, well, a lot of the jazz guys, even though I don't play jazz, uh, John Coltrane, uh, Eric Dolphy, uh, a sax player out of New York named Chico Freeman, a bass player named Cecil McBee, uh, Jack DeJanette, the great drummer. Um, as far as music that's more closely related to what I do, uh, Sonny, Sonny Terry and, and Brian McGee, Lightning Hopkins, um, that whole that whole group of acoustic players, including a, a player named Paul Jeremiah, who um, most people never heard about, wonderful player. But uh, I have, a, I have a, a, a batch of them. And, and, from a, and some, a lot of what influenced me as a, as a writer, which was part of all this, because I'm only doing originals, um, a lot of that was literary people like Jack London and um, a guy named Robert Olmsted and Ernest Hemingway and that crap. Because the truth is, you know, I, I've written... The words for me are at least as at least equal and maybe 60 yeah. 40 so yeah. and, uh, give me a wee laugh do you remember what the first concert was that you ever attended oh absolutely oh that's easy um the first one i went to was hot tuna dr john and the allman brothers at the field house in iowa city iowa and i went with my my mentor teacher john 
And I was coming down. I went up to the, the restroom, bathroom, and came back along a long corridor where you could look directly to the backstage. It's old yep. days, right? I mean, and it was 1976, five or six. I see Dr. John and his whole crew all dressed up in their New Orleans Mardi Gras stuff walking toward me. And I'm, you know, young guy. I just stopped. And right before he turned the corner, Dr. John looked at me and nodded his head. <laughs> and I said, how can you forget that concert? Yeah, very cool. Yeah, it's the best. Yeah, it's also cool that they... It's, it's cool that they even acknowledged you. You know, there's sometimes... Maybe more so nowadays where it's the person on stage, they're almost unreachable, you know, because it's, it's, it's a different it, type. Of it's a different world and it's a more dangerous world, honestly. Um, yeah. You know, in the United States especially, <laughs> in 1975, it was highly unlikely I had a gun. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, to give you a laugh as well, Nathan, um, the people that I have on the podcast... If it's somebody that I know, normally I would start the conversation, the podcast, by asking them, do you remember how we met? And, you know, we kind of take it from there. Obviously, we've never met before, but um, if you were to ask me, how how do you know about Nathan? I found this out in my, uh, out in my little man cave. So I don't know if you can see that. Oh, yeah. That's the show that, that actually made it possible. For me yeah. to play in the UK for the yeah. next many, many that, tours. So the, a funny story, that, that was me and my dad went along to that that gig in Glasgow at the Orin Moor downstairs. Yeah. And uh, what's funny is, and it, it's just a coincidence, there's no relation or that, but my dad's name is James McMurtry. <laughs> right? And what happened was, he was, I think he was on holiday one day. He, he was on vacation somewhere. And he seen someone with a James McMurtry t-shirt on. And he was kind of thinking, why? He'd, he'd never heard, but he's thinking, why is somebody walking around with my name on their t-shirt? And he got speaking to them and they're like, oh no, you should check him out. This is, you know, he's a musician. And uh, <laughs> He checked him out and uh, he bought a couple of his CD. And uh, me and my dad would go to a lot of concerts together. And it was just t- back in 2017, he'd said to us, oh, James McMurtry's coming to Glasgow. Will we get tickets? So I was like, yeah, let- let's get tickets. We'll go along. And, uh, and obviously it was yourself as the support. I think there was maybe two support. I think there was yourself yeah. and maybe else. There was a band before me, which was the guy who owns the brewery for Lagunitas Beer. And he had a trio, kind of like, yeah. a, almost like a frat rock, hard rock trio. But I have, wow. to, say, I have to say, Nathan, you, you, were, you were our favorite for the, for the evening out of the, the uh, thank you. And, uh, and if memory say, I might be wrong here, so you correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure you had brought your own beer over and, no. and the guy had, from Lagunitas brought his own I, beer. I think you had it behind the bar. So if you went up to the bar and said your name or said a line from one of your songs, you got a free pint. That was something oh, like that. See, that's interesting how memory works. Because it was the guy before me who owned a brewery who brought his beer. Oh, is that what it was? I and as a matter of fact, I will never forget because I heard him do the speech about getting your own free beer. And when I came on stage, I said, is that guy before me giving away free beer? And the crowd was boisterous. Yeah, yeah. I said, well, then I'm fucked. <laughs> I've never forgotten it. And I thought maybe my, uh, yeah, it was, I also got points for, um, the crowd was polite, I think. And I said, are we in Edinburgh? <laughs> I was thinking back and I was like, I, I thought it was yourself that had brought yeah. the beer or something like that. But uh there you go. But it was a good gig from what I remember. Um, uh, thank you. And uh, we, we did enjoy it. And that's obviously how I got introduced to your music. So it, it was quite... We went to see James McMurtry. We ended up coming away, like, enjoying Nathan Bell. So there you go. Oh, that's that's great to hear, man. And and that was one of my favourite shows I've ever played, actually. Yeah, the, the, Orin, the Orin Moor, I've been in there two or three times for different gigs. It, it's such a cool... 
a cool venue because it's it's not too small, but it's not too big. It's like the perfect size. Oh, it's great. No, it's fantastic. Yeah, but um, thinking obviously of um, recording. So I know you're saying you're about to go into the studio. Yeah, I'm going back out to make a follow up to the record I did five years ago. Yeah. How do you do? You have a preferred way in which you record in the studio. So, for example, do you record maybe the guitar and the, does the is there a band playing? Do you record live or do you do everything layered? I record voice and guitar is absolutely live, um, and it's never auto tuned. It's never punched into. Whatever you hear on my records is a live vocal, just like in nineteen sixty two. You know. And do you, uh, do you play guitar a lot of, parts as well? Do you Go do ahead. a clip back? No, no, no. Just, just now. Just, yeah, just completely straightforward. And um, when I record with these guys for these records, because I make stuff on my own, but the records I make with uh, Need yeah. to Know Music, I have a good uh, ba- uh, sorry, a drummer named Alvino Bennett who mm-hmm. comes along and he plays, and so he and I record at the same time. So it's not a click track; it's a live guy and. Um, yeah. But I, the truth is, I, I was, I'm lucky in that my sense of rhythm's always been real solid. Uh, yeah. I can use a quick track without any problem whatsoever, but I just don't necessarily need it. Yeah. It's interesting because I have spoke with people previously as well, uh, and everybody records differently. Sometimes, oh, yeah. it, sometimes it depends on the style of music as well that, that, you're, at, that you're playing. But... Um, I was talking to someone and we were discussing bands from the olden days, the olden days that, you know, there's all these bands now that have got like, their albums are viewed as classic albums. So you've got The Doors, The Who, The Beatles, Creedence, Clearwater, all these types of bands. And when you go way back and listen to their stuff, a lot of it was recorded live in the studio. They just mic'd everything up and then they went for it. And they maybe, used a couple of overdubs just to fix maybe one or two wee mistakes. Mm-hmm. But because technology was pretty poor back then, yeah. what, they, what they lacked in technology, they definitely made up for in creativity. Absolutely. But the question that I had put to previous guests, and I'll put it to you as well, is now that technology has came on so much, has that killed the creativity a wee bit? because the technology is so well, or does it just depend on the artist? Well, you have to look at the world we're in now. Um, you have access to uh, a thousand times more artists than you ever had before. Maybe yeah. more, maybe a million times. So the quality of the artist is going to be um, the only the only real key factor, because you have to look at it like this. Like, um, before he was a lunatic, Kanye West made some pretty good records. Mm-hmm. And he did it in a way I don't even know how to do. You know, sample setup, beat setup, all that stuff. Um, That said, a guy on a guitar can still sit down and be brilliant, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And digital makes my life a lot easier because this morning I had to send some tracks out to California. I went and sat in front of my, sat down with my system that I've got, recorded very, very quickly seven songs that I needed to get out there, was able to save them and and send them off within like two hours. and. I still think you have to be able to do the performance. There is <clears throat> these out, these songs that are built bottom up. Yeah, they can be great pop songs, but you know, I feel I always feel like there's something missing. Um, yep. You know, the you think about think about Smokey Robinson in the studio with a full orchestra, and they're yep. all playing at the same time. Yeah, or think about um, you know, think about the Who live at Leeds. Might be yeah. one of the greatest records ever made. Um, you know, those are great records, but to each their own. There are people who just don't like that stuff because it's not click tracked and auto tuned and perfectly set on a grid. And yeah. they can like what they like, and I guess we'll like what we like. I think it's that thing. I, I, I personally think sometimes <clears throat> the music nowadays it, it can almost be too perfect that it, it, it loses something. Like maybe it's the Agreed. human. But the other thing I was saying to. One of the recording engineers that came on previously was when I'm recording, even if it's layering it up, I still like to play the the song start to finish. So I don't like to record a verse and then copy and paste it. 
I like to record no. start to finish so that yes you might be trying to to play evenly throughout the song but but it's got a feel to it that is missed if it's a copy and paste copy and paste it just ends up being too perfect which sounds silly but it loses something when there's when it's almost too perfect to think oh no it's true if you think about the great songs think about the rolling stones wild horses you know that song nobody's in tune with each other <laughs> yeah. you, you go back and listen to it the bass is a little wobbly the keyboard is just i don't think they even tuned the piano before they played it yeah. um you know jagger was never known for pitch perfection uh, but if you listen and, and the tempo's all over the place because in a great song usually the chorus is a little faster than the verse just yeah. incrementally because you're pushing right yeah and charlie watts was was great at pushing the choruses and that's a great song and you put that song next to any one of these completely produced on the grid songs and it'll blow it away every time sometimes i think sometimes i think the musician years ago was better because they had to be better because they, they couldn't use the studio to perfect everything so i remember watching um the doors and it was them recording la woman and uh, it was john densmore on drums and he's saying there's no click track that's him keeping the beat for the rest of the guys and it gets to that nice slow bit in the middle and then it builds up to the last verse and chorus which is meant to match the same tempo as at the start of the song you say i think i'm a, about a millisecond out he says but he says i'm pretty close it sounds pretty damn good you know nowadays that would be absolute perfection but it might not sound quite as good i agree with you and i'm not i'm not inclined to think that everything old is better than everything new but mm -hmm. i do believe that you still have to play the instrument yeah but um Here's a question as well. Do you enjoy recording? Do you enjoy creating something from nothing? Or I know some musicians will simply record and write songs because it allows them to then get out on stage because out on stage is where they want to be. Do you enjoy the recording process as much as the gigging process? Well, I love recording. I wish that I was wealthy enough to just come into the studio every morning and do whatever the hell I felt like doing. I, yeah. I love recording. and. When I go into sessions, I don't have enough money or time, or I don't want to hold up a record company. So I'm rehearsed to the point of where I can play the songs as well as if I play them live. Mm -hmm. um, and I like playing live, but the truth of the matter is, you know, one of the, my favorite things is to work on soundtrack stuff because, you know, there's, you're just doing it for the point of purpose of doing it. Yeah. Um, I guess if it doesn't get out there, I don't know why you're doing it, but yeah. uh, it's still well, fun. What about at this day and age as well? Because, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm younger than yourself, but when I was younger, you know, there were still music shops that existed that you could go and you could flip through the CDs and the records and, you know, and what, what I do when I was younger is I would maybe find an album and I would buy it, having never heard the, the songs, never yep. heard... The band, I bought this album because the album cover is cool looking. Yeah, right? absolutely. And nowadays, because act, uh, music is accessed differently, you, you can stream it, you can download it, you can get it on YouTube, Google Play, all these different places. Is artwork still important? Well, I hope so because I care about it. Yeah. I mean, I, whether it's important or not, I. I think we're living in two very separate worlds that are split right down the middle. I think we're living in the world of the younger people. And I teach guitar and I teach to a lot of teenagers. And they think about how to access music differently than we did. Yeah. Um, you know, and they think in, I have a couple of them that are kind of old school that showed up basically with David Bowie albums in hand and said, I want to be like this. And, yeah. and they, you know, they have turntables and, they buy records because they like the jackets. That's coming back, no question about it. Yeah. Um, does the visual matter? Oh yeah, it, it matters. I don't know if you remember the first Cars album. Mm -hmm. It didn't ring a bell at all. It it had. I didn't buy it, even though everyone told me it was a great record because I hated the cover so much. So obviously, <laughs> and and they still matters to some extent. I yeah. I don't think it ever goes completely away. I can remember my dad always telling me when he was at, when he left high school 
So he would have been maybe 17 time and he, he started to work in Glasgow. So he would get the bus through to Glasgow, start making uh, start making some money. And there's a, street, a main street in Glasgow called Sucky Hall Street. Of course. He says he, he would walk down there and there was a record store that he would go into and, and he'd flick through till you find something. He says the coolest thing that you could have done back in the 70s was buy your favourite record, maybe from your favourite band, and walk home with it under your arm. But, you know, get on the bus and everybody can see what you've bought. And it was almost like making a statement. A wee bit like Understood. if we'd buy a t-shirt, probably. Yeah. Let everybody I know, know. I believe that. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I still think it's, it's all part of the package. And, um, Absolutely. It's just, it's strange. You're saying that you obviously teach young people. One of the really cool things about today, which didn't exist when I was younger, was access to YouTube. See, if you, want to, if you want to learn a song on the guitar now, you type it in and there'll be a thousand people giving you a lesson on how to play the song. Back when I was a teenager learning the guitar, you didn't have the internet. Oh, no. yeah, no. So you learn that stuff on your own. You had to, you know, you would m potentially maybe get a wee, like a bit of sheet music from a music shop if you were really lucky. But a lot of it, you just had to learn it by ear. Yep. And that's how you done it. But uh, there is, there's good and bad things with the way music was, the way music is just now, and it maybe just depends on on the individual. I think there's always good music. I think yeah. there's always people coming up who want that. Um, some things have changed. The amount of money that's involved in the business that no musician will ever see is yeah. is all planted firmly on the visual side. So uh, the people coming out of the TikTok universe are younger and younger and younger and will produce less and less significant music. Yeah. Um, it's very unusual to find anybody now who comes, comes along with uh, a point of view that really worries anybody. And to be honest with you, that was sort of the measure of the 70s was were you irritating any of the uh, any of the people in power and that's just yeah. not happening yeah so nathan we have been quite serious up to this point asking some serious yeah. so <laughs> before we end things i'm going to ask you some fun questions right so imagine you are able to go back in time anywhere in the world and you're able to go and attend one concert what would be the concert that you wish you could have attended? That's a rough one, but I think it would have to be uh, Coltrane at the Village Vanguard in the 50s. <laughs> there you go. Right? And I can tell by the applause there was a seat available. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, obviously you've got a few instruments, you've got your vocals. Is there an instrument that you wish that you could play that you don't play at the moment? You know, I'm a really bad drummer. Yeah. I can go in the studio and I can put down a four in the floor beat and fake it. And I can show somebody else what they're supposed to do. But I'm not a drummer. And if I could be a great drummer, that would be, that would be cool. Yeah, I, th I think I'm probably the same. I'm a, I, I'm a guitarist that thinks he can play drums. Ah, that's better than me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, now, as you know, there is millions and millions of really amazing songs that have been recorded over the years. What's the one song that you wish that you could have been sat in the recording studio witnessing it being recorded? Oh, uh, that's a hard one, but I think it'd have to be the Rolling Stones, You Can't Always Get What You Want. Yeah, yeah, that'd be pretty cool. So uh, that's a, I think Let It Bleed might be one of the great records ever made. Yeah. And a uh, last question for you, Nathan. Mount Rushmore, who is your four either musicians or bands that are just perfection for yourself? Oh, wow. None of them are going to be watching because I think they're all dead. But, um, <laughs> I would say Hendrix. Um... John Coltrane. I yep. know it's a cliche, but the dude was amazing. He yep. earned his spot. So, um, 
Joni Mitchell. No, she's yeah. not dead. Okay, Joni Mitchell. And um, this is a rough one. The last one's going to be hard. Stravinsky. There you go. It's a great question, that last one, because it doesn't matter who I get on, you get a different four, four answers every time. And it, it's fascinating to hear just what other, what, what, what do other people enjoy? Uh, it is, and it's interesting because, you know, I just had a moment where I, I have a student who probably would have said, Joe Satriani, Joe Satriani, Joe Satriani, Joe Satriani. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe Steve Bai in there as well. Yeah, just stick a couple of these shredder guys in there. Absolutely. Yeah. Nathan, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. It was and, a pleasure. Uh, I will, uh, I'll keep a wee eye on you on social media. Next time you're in Glasgow, I'll give you a wee shout. I am in Glasgow uh, the end of May, May 30th. There you go. I'll see, I'll see if I can come along and uh, I'll give you uh, a wee shout. Maybe meet up. Let me know. But uh, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers.